in-depth analysis of national current affairs. Freshly pressed. Macron. One them first. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Max on. Invest your money. A very good morning to you, Lagos. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this morning on Freshly Press 91. It is on Smooth 98.1 FM Lagos and this morning Lagos will go through the stories and uh, give you detailed analysis of our new super stories and joining us in the studio there's a lot of men here uh, we have three wonderful analysts yes indeed uh, uh, yeah yes so. indeed. we've got uh, Justin at Justin EJ up on Twitter and also we've got morning Lagos good morning good morning also we've got uh, chemists at George Ike good morning morning and of course, Fred is well joining us this morning. Good morning. At FB Allison up on Twitter. You also can reach out to us. Let us know your thoughts about the uh, the stories we'll be sharing with you. Reach out to us on WhatsApp. The number to do that is 0809 0981. And also, you can reach out to us on Twitter. We are at smooth 981 of them with the hashtag freshly pressed 981. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And from Punch News, we've always starts with our first story. And uh, I'll come to you, Justin, for the analysis of this. The federal government is planning to spend about 1.02 billion naira to conduct 12 economic surveys through the National Bureau of Statistics in 2019. As so out of this sum, uh, the recurrent expenditure, the so 2019 budget is an estimate of uh, about 8.83 trillion naira. They're taking out this sum. Uh, take us through the details of the story and how this money is going to get allocated. Okay. Um... This for me is a positive uh, mm. because data is king. Yes. A survey implies data is going to be generated. Besides, we like to know. <laughs> exactly. We yeah, would like to details, know, right? Yes. Yeah. So, um, uh, what we have here is uh, they've broken down in this news report the composition of the national budget. So, we know that uh, it's 8.83 trillion, made up of 4.4 4, 4 trillion for recurrent expenditure, which is 50%. That's that's mm -hmm. on the high side, but we've had that problem in our budgeting cycle for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, only 25% of the total budget um, is uh, earmarked for CAPEX, which is 2 trillion. And then you have and another 2 trillion. CAPEX being capital expenditure. Capital expenditure. Okay. And you have another 2 trillion, another 25% for debt servicing. So we have 25% uh, of the budget for debt servicing, 25% for CAPEX, capital expenditure, and then 50% um, for uh, recurrent expenditure. Mm -hmm. One of the drivers of that, uh, I think, is the, the huge wage bill of the federal government. We've spoken about that before. Sure. Yes. But down to the issue of um, the survey. So one billion is uh, earmarked for a total of twelve um, surveys to be conducted by the National Bureau of Statistics in the 2019 fiscal um, period. The breakdown of it shows that about the, the largest sum of it, um, being 373 million, is earmarked for. Uh, Job creation and labor force survey, mm -hmm. which I think is quite interesting because what that then means is uh, we're going to get a lot of data on the issues of employment, unemployment, underemployment when mm -hmm. you begin to dig into it. Mm -hmm. And that data is necessarily needed for you to, uh, in any sort of way, begin to create interventions um, uh, for our employment situation in the country. Mm -hmm. And then you have another 121 million. million for, socio for a socioeconomic survey mm -hmm. and uh, 63 million for a manufacturing sector survey. So what it looks like here is um, the money has been broken down. So various sectors um, have been focused on a total of 12 of them and various sums of money have been allocated. But the largest of them, like I said earlier on, is uh, 300 and something million for, for the employment um, statistics. Mm. So what I'm really interested in is seeing uh, the implementation of these sums. Exactly. <laughs> which exactly. Is, which I know most Nigerians be interested it, it, in. It all comes down to execution. Yes. Um, uh, many are, I mean, plans can be a dime a dozen, mm. but if, if you do not execute properly, um, you go nowhere. So um, the challenge here, like you said, is how do we harness this data mm -hmm. positively for good? Right? Because mm -hmm. if, the, if the survey is done right, you're going to generate a lot of data. That's How right. are you going to warehouse that data? What are the analytics you're going to apply to inform policy positions and, of the government? And then are, they, are we going to be referring back to these data, which are very important in, in themselves to 
uh, help make informed decisions based on certain, certain programs like you listed. Exactly, that's what should inform policy. Yeah. Data should inform policy. Uh, but right. more importantly, it's even to institutionalize the process of capturing data. So you're not going to be budgeting uh, in another cycle for uh, we want to do another survey. Mm. Let's institutionalize the process of harnessing this data at every point of contact with government agencies. And the site. Mm. Like this, Thank you very much. Uh, let's move on now to this next uh, story from New Telegraph. Uh, actually, let, let me skip that and go to you, Fred, for uh, this next story. And it raises alarm over new votes buying method. And it's a report from Punch newspaper. The Independent National Electoral Commission on Monday raised alarm over a new method of vote buying being devised to undermine the voting process. So the INEC chairman, Mahmoud Yakubu, revealed this and said that now, partisan actors are going around buying permanent voter cards from voters or financially inducing them to collect the voter identification numbers on their PVCs. They said uh, they should go anticipated that they could use this to sway the votes or just maybe find some way to hack the system. But INEC says no. We're, we're three steps ahead of you to actually make sure that. I mean, take us through the details and let us know the, the measures INEC have put in place and how effective you think this will be. Yeah, so INEC is saying that. Uh, people generally don't have a lot of trust in the system, and that's what's uh, pushing this uh, PVC card and uh, voter identification number uh, buying process you know, ahead of time. Um, and they're doing it in a way, so it's not waiting for you to come to the day of elections. They're buying it before then, so they're inducing you to for that, that day. And that, uh, so they are, they've put in some measures in place uh, to make sure uh, this you know, one of them is like not allowing you to take your phones in there, so you can't take a picture of your proof to the person that stayed you. Um, the other one is um, they've they've changed like the the, the, the process of the ballot box um, for the voters. Mm. Um, anyway, all of this I, to me just points to um, a point that we need to understand that back in the day, historically, um, whatever. If you had like 10,000 or 2 million voters out coming to vote, the people didn't really care because they would just stop the ballot boxes sometimes and tell you the result. That means the, the voting structure or people are being, are taking account of their voting process more, right? And they're more accountable. Like the, the people are more valid, you know? So now you're buying votes from them. You understand? So in the past, it was like, I can care less who comes or not, you know? Mm. So the power is actually shifting to the people. So we need this progression to happen more. Not just the power shifting, the system has changed. Completely. Yeah, the system has changed. Yeah. But then the other thing we need to change is actually informing the people. So, so once you have the information and you have the right questions to ask the politicians, so you have the right questions to ask, right? Mm. So it's like, you, you can't even buy my vote because I'm like I'm like stuck on something, you know, that I need to work and I understand that whatever action I take today is mm. going to affect me for four years. That's right. right. You know? Thank you very much, uh, Fred. Let's uh, come back to you now, Justin, for the this next story from New Telegraph. 2019 court nullifies all APC primaries, restrains INEC from recognizing Abe Cole as new candidate. You will recall the APC primaries in River State, uh, you know, they had I issues with who was a consensus candidate from one party, and it was just pretty interesting because we had a situation where two factions of APC emerged. They were going back and forth to court to seek a nullification of, of one faction's candidate. But take us through the scene that the court has now thrown them all both out, out, yes. uh, and they're they are saying that they're going to come back to contest. This is the modern day version of things fall apart. Okay, so the news report essentially is talking about the crisis uh, in the River State APC and what has then played out. Okay, so um, we have here a federal high court in River State has given a judgment restraining INEC from representing from presenting any of the mm -hmm. candidates of the APC mm -hmm. um, as a gubernatorial candidate. In es in essence. The APC has no candidates as it stands. As it stands, just in the a month, a month to so a month, month to <laughs> D-Day, and this is this is really self-inflicted harm. Okay, the APC for some reason couldn't get its house in order in River State. Um, you had several several candidates in fighting mm. uh, within the party. You had uh, Magnus Abe, you had uh, Toya Cole, I think you had uh, Chifumu Lugubu. Mm -hmm. um, 
And at the end of the day, it couldn't sort out the internal issues and people started going to court. Um, Abi went to court, Ko, Abi also went to court. But the national leadership of APC at the time had, uh, you know, fronted Ko or backed Ko as a consensus candidate. So there were two, there were two parallel primaries held um, by the APC in River State, right? Mm -hmm. One of them by the Abi faction, the other by the Ko faction. Incidentally, the Abe fact, Abe scored at 144,000 votes in the primary where he was fielded, and Cole scored uh, a comparatively less, low amount of 3,000 votes in the comparatively. <laughs> Just to be politically correct. Yeah. Okay. And so, but the party obviously Cole is the is the star boy uh, for the national leadership of the APC. So they went ahead and presented his name to INEC and INEC um, accepted it. But then the Abbey faction uh, cried blue murder saying, no, no, you can't do that. Besides, we had, they had, the Abbey faction had uh, a court judgment for, from the, a judgment from the appeal court, which they took to the Supreme Court and which the Supreme Court invalidated, right? And asked them all to go back to a lower court, which is the federal court in the state, which has now said, you know what guys, you don't have a candidate. And then, funny, in a funny twist of the story, the PDP actually in River State also went to court saying, listen, these guys don't have their house in order, so declare their candidates null and void. And um, the initial response from the APC guy is, like, what's your local say? I mean, it's our internal affairs. But as it turns out, the expanded electoral act does allow a party to bring an action in the event that another party's affairs are not abiding by the electoral act, which is the strength of um, the PAP solution. So at the end of the day, we have a situation where, as it stands today, like I've said before, a uh, month to D-Day, the APC has no horse in the race in River State. That's sad. But just one important one sentence context. The votes, um, votes primaries were conducted by different factions of the APC, okay. which is essentially what the court was, was, was stating. You know, the party as a whole didn't conduct a primary in a form which it which was readily recognized as one where it gave all the members the, the opportunity to express their opinion. And so, go get your house back. <laughs> on go. Interesting. <laughs> it's on go. So, wait, uh, let me get this right. There's no APC candidate for River as State. Mm. As, 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 as it stands. Yeah. Some believe it will be 30 days. Wishing also. on a prayer. <laughs> All right, so let's move on now very quickly to this next story from this day newspaper. Teleology pulls out from Nine Mobile, seeks to uh, exit shareholding. Uh, so this is for you, Perry Kemesit. Now, this is just two months after Teleology uh, received approval to take over the operations of Nine Mobile as its preferred bidder. Uh, I, I know that back then when this news broke, that Teleology was the sole uh, beneficiary of this of this bid, uh, a lot of people were very excited about that, seeing that Nine Mobile uh, was, you know, anticipating a takeover by uh, a business. But as it stands by this pullout, so remember just uh, a, few, a week ago, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there were rumors that was, they were touted by, from the opposition, uh, you know, indicating or insinuating that President Muhammad Buhari had a tie or a hand in procuring such companies with Houston as well. Uh, Take us through the stories I, I, and the ties. It, 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 there are a lot of moving parts. Okay, so essentially, um, according to the story in this day, and there isn't much here, but there are other sources online where you know the story is broken down into detail, so mm -hmm. I would encourage our listeners to go check those out. Um, it, these days, quoting sources, and a lot of, and a few other platforms are quoting sources within the Nine Mobile Organization who um, have said that the reason why technology organs is pulling out is because they've become increasingly uncomfortable with actions taken outside of the agreed business plan. So what happened in this case is technology holdings is essentially the one government for investors led by a young lady, the former CEO of MT Nigeria, first CEO mm. of MT Nigeria, and you know, many credits within the industry being primarily responsible for setting that business on a successful path that it's in. Yeah, yeah. Um, Lagos, I didn't say that. Um, the second partner are uh, Teleology Nigeria Limited, and this is where the political um, angle that the comes PDP in. has brought into this comes mm. in. So the Nigerian partners are allegedly fronted by Alaji Issa Puntua, who many know is a very, very close associate, um, associate of Muhammad Buhari. And so what this story seems to suggest, it 
seems to be, and this is the unstated but clearly, you know, the clear context that is shining through from the reporting, mm. is that the foreign partners are uncomfortable with some of the actions that Teleology Nigeria is involved in. As a matter of fact, the story just mentions that as Teleology audience is pulling out of, um, of Nigeria, Teleology Nigeria Limited, which is the Nigerian partner company, will be required to change their name. So it hints at a, a a a falling out which 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 was pretty significant and all of this leaves nine mobile in a very precarious situation this is nigeria's fourth biggest operator in its heyday it had 22 million subscribers yes. now it's a shell of itself it's suffered a lot of customer attrition because since the entire controversy around first the um the non-performing loan that it's all that you know took out from the consortium of nigerian banks was broke in 2017. Lots of customers have been voting with their feet. They are right about 50 million of the check the latest entity subscriber numbers. Okay. And so there's a real world effect to this away from the the corporate, you know, the, the, the corporate hush trading. So, so political where, where does that leave Nine Mobile? Because, I mean, they're in a space that has had a lot of shuffling and, and replacements, you know, bodies, so to speak. But where does that leave them now? I mean, it's and Nine Mobile is not only the interested you know party to, to talk about here. So, it, it's it's worth noting that this um, bidding process was was a fairly competitive process. You had you know other operators. You had Airtel. You had Blue. You had Smile. You right. had Elios, mm. right? Who put in bids, and then the NCC decided that Teleology had the technical competence. So Teleology won essentially because the the, the the institutional caliber of the foreign partners they were bringing into and the credibility they had in the international community which would have aided nine mobile to so easily source financing of, you know mm. to to improve its nigerian operations you know was their selling point and so it's very hard to see how nine mobile progresses from there would there be another bid process would uh, you know would, would another carrier want to touch them would you know another foreign investor be interested in them it's, it's really complicated I uh, have a message here on WhatsApp from Papi K. He sends us uh, in. It says, after paying and restructuring their loans with the banks a few weeks ago, who would bear the bronze, Biko? Uh, I hope the banks and the employees of Nine Mobile wouldn't suffer for this. Another message in from Cruz. It says, so Nine Mobile is now having relationship issues like Airtel always had. Oh, wow. And then we have this other message in uh, from, uh, okay, please add your names to your message. Okay, Uche. Uche says, good morning, Valentine. Uh, PVC buying isn't trader money the largest corporates? Well, We'll look into more of that. Uh, this other message here from it's a pretty long one. The Yinka says, "I feel Anik needs to grow up. If they have put in measures in place, uh, they should keep it short. So let that be your joker a day for to the elections, so that the buyers and buyers will need more time to come up with another method method of vote buying. And maybe it's high time they need to advise the vice president to." As a former vice president, you mean uh, take a chill pill in the trader money thing. Actually, the present vice president of Shibata is what you, who you're referring to. Uh, that could also qualify as vote buying in a way. Another question we must ask INEC is: there, Is there anyone in INEC that can do what Mrs. Zakari is currently doing, so we can put this bloodline madness to an end for that, for the sake of sanity? All right, Inka, a lot of uh, lines you got wrong here, but mm. we'll, we'll take a look at your message later. Okay, well, let's go to our next story, and this one I'm coming to you with, uh, Justin. It says here, um, Nigerian government has to reach an agreement, and there's been a back and forth so far. So this is an updated news. Now, the Nigerian government has reached an agreement with strike university lecturers, uh, raising the possibility of ending the teacher's prolonged industrial action. Now, the national president of the Academic Staff Union of Universities, that's Biodo Nguyenmi, uh, said the National Executive Committee of the Union will review its decisions based on the new commitments by the federal government. So what are your thoughts about this? Well, first of all, it's um, it's important to note that what this article says is raises the possibility of ending the strike. So, guys, uh, um, sorry, the strike is not over yet. Mm. They've reached an agreement, and uh, the likelihood of that strike being ended um, is higher than it was before. However, uh, Mr. Gunyemi has not told us when the next next meeting will hold okay. uh, of our suit, so we are basically still in the dark. But on the positive side of things... But they uh, said they indicated here that they have a meeting on Thursday, so should that be something we should look towards? Yes, you're correct. Um, so let's hopefully um, look towards uh, somewhere towards the end of the week, mm -hmm. so maybe after the meeting, because there are still some issues they have to resolve. So some of the discussions with the government, they need to take it back to the NEC, the NEC needs to have a consensus. Uh, which will then determine if they actually are going to end the strike. 
But so far they've been on strike uh, since, since uh, November 4th. 4th. Yeah, and for those who might not know the history, uh, the details of some of the history of this, you know, uh, the Johnson administration had reached an agreement for university funding to the tune of 220 billion annually with ASU uh, for six years, starting 2009. Okay. Now, clearly, that's that's that sounds like a high bar. And this is one of the reasons why they're having problems with the current government. Exactly. Funding that commitment is a serious problem. And I think, uh, my opinion, is we need to take a long, hard look at university funding as a whole. Much the same way you should look at campaign funding when you talk about politics. The university funding structure is not sustainable in Nigeria. The government can't keep shelling out. The ASU guys themselves need to improve quality of output so that you can attract funding from both the corporate, publics, and individuals. Thank you very much for that. So let's move on to our next story. And this one I'm coming to you with uh, Ikemesi. Uh, it says here from the New Telegraph, Tinubu takes full charge of my campaign. And uh, well, I, I thought it was a fallout from yesterday, basically. But uh, it says President Buhari uh, has declared that former Lagos State Governor and National Leader of the All Progressive Congress, Ashura Chibola Tinubu, will take charge of his campaign. And it goes further. But Ikemesi, let's dive into it. What's your thought about this? Okay, so this happened while the president was inaugurating the APC Presidential Campaign Council. Right. So um, a couple of things. So from, from an optical standpoint, there has been some insinuation in various political camps that the president's relationship with Tinubu has been somewhat strained. Mm -hmm. This, at least on the face of things, okay. puts that matter to rest. Whether it substantially deals with some of the substantive differences that they have been known to, and, you know, you, you know they, they have been known to have, right, and whether this advances their relationship moving forward. That remains to be seen. Secondly, from a political strategic standpoint, the president, for example, um, during the event said that the operational bulk of his campaign will stop at the table of Tinubu, he told members, um, he told APC members at the event that his campaign and the party will be anchored on the performance of the government in the last four years. And my response to that was, really? Do you really want to run on your record in the last four years? There was something I told. You. There was something I said on another platform. In this case, in this case, it was a, it was a television platform. I said the APC's challenge in, tw in this year. I should stop saying 2019. Right? We are not 2019. in 2019, right? But the APC's challenge this year, in contrast with 2015, is that now in 2015 only the PDP had a governing record with which Nigerians could benchmark their promises. Mm -hmm. In 2019, now the APC now has a governing record. Mm -hmm. They they. They essentially aren't tabula rasa. They, they aren't running on a clean slate. The challenge with that now, from the average voter standpoint, is that Nigerians don't feel like they have many good choices as it were. So you've got 16 years of relative underperformance by one party, and then you've got three years of an abysmal social, political, economic, military security performance by the APC. And so both parties are hobbled, and they need to deal with those things. Whether team is the appropriate person right now to run the campaign, run the campaign for the that's APC. That's decision, yeah? Again. Yeah. yeah that's <laughs> and decision. Uh, also to note that there are other parties, there are a lot of other parties to choose exactly. from, so it's not just we BDP or APC, you yeah, have multiple choices. Um, let, so that's the pretense of choice. It, no, it's not, not, no, it's not no, the no, pretense of choice. Available no, choices. No, we have, you know, the point is this. How many parties now? 91 political parties. Yeah, the point is this. How many of those parties have no recognition outside Lagos Abuja? And let me be generous, but how many of them have a geographic spread, how many of them have a political network where they, they would be able to I directly think, market? I think that they all do. They may have a disadvantage in terms of how deep their pockets are. In to terms run of financial campaign, might, yes. But when it comes okay. to representation, they actually do. And you're we trying do, to say we all, simply don't have the data. You're trying to say all 91 parties have party offices in every local government yeah, area yeah. of the state. Mm. Only two parties in this country Hold on, there, that, there are requirements for getting a party license. From uh, I would disagree Thailand. with you, Kemesis. Okay. Uh, every party, in <laughs> principle, has, has an office. Yes. 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 No, because it's a requirement for government, but we're not sure about We will that. see in 40 days. All right, so Facebook and a phone number, that's an office. <laughs> we have a quick message here from Tosan. Tosan, <laughs> send us on WhatsApp. It says, good morning, everyone. My worry concerning the data survey is how the money is going to be implemented and how it will be used properly and not embezzled. Okay, so let's move on to our next story. And this one I'm coming to you with uh, Fred. It says NNPC insists on December deadline to end petrol import. So I'll give you a, an insight quickly. It says uh, the Nigeria Petroleum Corporation has indicated it will meet up with the December 2019 deadline. 
can they do this with all that's going on right now? The strikes, the election coming, is it possible, Fred? I don't know. That question you asked, is it possible? First of all, we're not an NPC employer, an NPC group. Okay. But I'm just being hopeful by what's um, listed here, right? Um, the goal is to get Port Harcourt, Lori, and Cardinal Refinery up to speed. Um, the, the current um, DG, um, the current group, man uh, group managing director of um, NNPC, uh, Dr. Barrow, has stated that we, to keep up with the price of 45 uh, 145 uh, naira per liter. We're spending 25 naira a liter, and we're importing uh, about 3 billion liters for every 60 days. So we're spending about 75 billion, you know, every two months. Obviously, that's unsustainable. Not with, with so with, let's start from there. From the current situation we have on ground, that's unsustainable. Um, so the goal now is obviously to cut down on that. You can't stop, you know, paying. The, uh, the subsidy, right? The only way you can deal with it is actually getting your systems to work so that you're not importing more. The other thing is if we get power to work too, because a lot of people that are buying petrol, what are they using it for? To run their generators. Sure. So if we have power working, if we can improve the um, refineries, then we can get a, a, a dip at reducing this mm -hmm. amount of money that's being spent. On a surface level, though, rather on a deeper level, it seems as if it's just... Um, uh, I see. I see that Justin is uh, going towards that thought, but it just seems like you know it's a good thing looking at it. Uh, but uh, Justin, how do you perceive this favoring certain parties that are invested in the petroleum industry? Yes, the hands that rock the cradle are rocking the cradle. So we know about private investments and refining capacity in the country. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's been a, a lot of rhetoric around it, so you need to factor that into this conversation. And when policies begin to be um, shaped. Um, in favor of interest, like we've seen in certain other industries within the country. That's one issue to look at. Another issue is border control, mm. right? We're not building a wall, but um, we have a lot of leakage of products between Nigeria and other sub um, West African countries, right? If you cross the, the border to, to Kotonu and all of those places, you practically see petrol being sold at the border that comes across the border from Nigeria. So mm. all of the consumption that we are subsidizing is actually not being consumed in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So border control is another issue. Right? The NNPC can set deadlines all you want, but if we don't fix those issues, you're not going to meet any of those deadlines. Get yeah. down to work. Yeah, but the point is that if, we're, if I'm importing, I'm spending money to bring petroleum in to go somewhere else. But if the refinery is creating it, then there's money still coming to the system. All right. We do have right. to move on, though. We're, uh, we're, short, we're running out of time. Uh, real quick, Ikemesis, let's come to you with this one. Uh, the army had come back again to say that we invaded daily trust over national security breach. And uh, well, the director of Army Relations, uh, that's Brigadier General Sanyo Kuman, said uh, that uh, you know it, it, there was a breach of sections, basically one and two of official secrets. So, chemists, what are your thoughts about that? Um, I'm not so, I'm not, I'm, I'm not necessarily sold on the Army's interpretation. I mean, I've looked at this story. This story is still available online. You can go, you can go to the website of Daily Trust and actually look at the story. What essentially the Daily Trust said was a couple of towns in Bono State have been taken. The military is massing, not not just the military, the entire armed forces, okay. army, navy, air force, are massing to take A, B, C, D, E, F towns. They are going to get cooperation from the Borneo State Hunters Union. The paper quoted residents as confirming that there has been a mass movement of soldiers and military hardware into the area. There was no talk about what formations, what exact formations measures. the military, what the tactical measures would be. What quality of air support would be? But the what the does, level of does, intelligence? Does that undermine right? the sensitivity of that information? Not necessarily. When you when you look at a situation where this entire eight to nine year war has been prosecuted in relative terms, in the middle of a media black hole, we've been drip fed primarily what the military has said, and the military has been at pains to counter belligerently almost anyone. Who comes out with an account of what is going on in the Yeah, but giving an account is one thing, but doing it responsibly is another. That's, this I'm is not a, taking sides, I I'm know, just trying to make this you This is essentially my end. argument. Mm. I don't see anything irresponsible that Daily Trust did. Daily Trust essentially just said the military wants to do this in order to tackle this. They want to do A, B, C, D, E, F. They didn't even go into specific details. Where was the national security breach? All right. Thank, Thank you very so much, gentlemen. Uh, unfortunately, we can't go through most of your messages, but we're going to take uh, one of the stories extensively inside of Lagos Talks 981. So we'll have uh, 45 minutes to flesh out the details and for you to, you know, bear your mind on those. Uh, Lagos, coming up next, we talk entertainment inside of, of the grapevine. That's coming up at 8.15. Please do join us then.
Where it makes more money for you. Faster yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Faster yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.